The trade deadline is looming, only about a month away from the date of this video. We've had some insanely hectic deadline deals go through under the wire, with their short-term effects taking fringe playoff teams to new extraordinary heights. It's on those teams to go all in and believe in their roster enough to add one extra piece that can take them over the top. 2008 was arguably one of the greatest trade deadlines in MLB history. Mark Teixeira got flipped to the Los Angeles Angels, Manny Ramirez was a spark plug for an exciting Dodgers team, Jason Jason Bay took his talents from Pittsburgh to Boston, and Pudge Rodriguez became a Yankee pretty much all in the blink of an eye. But none of those deals even come close to the biggest of that season. A Cy Young winner whose team came a win shy of the World Series just the year prior would absolutely electrify a dormant baseball city and carry an underdog to an unlikely playoff push over a quarter of the century in the making. This is the story of how CC Sabathia became a legend in Brewers history. But before we can, let's set the stage. With a 4-3 loss on July 7th, the Brewers fell to 49-40. and For a team that finished May at 28-28 and and hadn't made the playoffs in 28 years, being 9 games over 500 seems like a good thing. But the front office knew that this success simply wasn't sustainable. They needed to supplement their starting rotation, a group that lost a young right-handed stud, Giovanni Gallardo, thanks to a torn ACL he suffered on May 1st. He had tossed three fantastic starts before going down and was sorely missed. So who else did they have? Well, well, to that point, Ben Sheets had pitched to a 2.77 ERA in 17 starts, while Jeff Supon and Dave Bush were pitching to a mark nearing 5.0. Youngster Seth McClung was thrust into the rotation in emergency, and he did do a viable job, but GM Doug Melvin knew that this team's pitching would not last. He also knew, however, that the offensively driven squad was one ace away from going over the top, with talents like Ryan Braun and Prince Fielder, among others. Luckily, an ace just happened to be available at that year's deadline, and he he was willing to move early on him. Let's go back a little bit first though, and rewind to October of the year before. The Cleveland Indians, who conquered the mighty Yankees in the ALDS, lost Game 7 of the ALCS against the eventual World Series champion Boston Red Sox. Had they won this game, they would have been the heavy favorites against a magic Colorado Rockies team. Instead, their championship drought exists to this day, and that's just baseball. Despite their recent success, Cleveland had unsuccessful contract extension negotiations with their former Cy Young and bona fide ace, CeCe Sabathia, who was set to hit free agency at the end of the 2008 season. Despite this, they hoped to make one last run with their homegrown ace in the following season, but the club never got themselves more than three games over 500. A nine-game losing streak at the end of June and beginning of July plunged them to a season-worst 16 games under 500 at 37 and 53. The fire sale was starting up in Cleveland officially, with their prized asset being CeCe Sabathia. He was upset with the performance of the team, the lack of effort made in negotiations, and the bluntness of their desire to trade him. As a result, he wasn't pitching to what he had proven he was capable of in his career. With a loss to the Texas Rangers on June 5th, CeCe hit a low point for his career with a 4.81 ERA and 3-8 record in 13 games started. Sabathia would round out June with a handful of good starts, helping to legitimize his value. With the Brewers calling early and still willing to match a steep price to acquire the ace, the pairing was a match made in heaven, but on July 7th, a deal was struck. Former AL Cy Young and impending free agent CeCe Sabathia was heading to Milwaukee, with highly touted prospect Matt Laporta and others heading to Cleveland as they began their rebuild. The Indians got a haul of young talent aside from Laporta, but none of them ended up panning out quite well in the end. It was actually the player to be named later that would become the most redeeming factor of the trade for the Indians, and the story of his selection is quite interesting, so let's take a quick detour. With the deal still in limbo before July 7th, Doug Melvin made a compromise to help push the envelope on the deal. He told the Cleveland front office that if Milwaukee got to the playoffs, Cleveland would get to handpick a prospect and vice versa for the opposite result. This enticed Cleveland to pull the trigger as it ended up giving them the opportunity to swipe away future all-star outfielder Michael Brantley. That's a fun fact, but for now, the focus was on CeCe. Lost in the scuffle of this trade was Sabathia's emotions for Cleveland. This was the organization that drafted him, the team he planned to spend his entire career with, but the events of the past year had disgruntled him and upset him so much that that dream had faded, but with the anxieties of starting a new seeming overwhelming, CeCe found himself fitting in quite well in Milwaukee very quickly. One issue we haven't discussed about Sabathia's tenure in Cleveland was the fact that he had been the lone black player on Cleveland's 25-man roster the year prior and was entering a season in which he and Dontrell Willis were the game's only significant black starting pitchers in baseball. Growing up watching the Dave Stewart's and Doc Goodens of the game as his idols, CeCe was rightfully frustrated with the roster construction 
instruction and the representation of black people in baseball. But in Milwaukee, CC found camaraderie in his teammates, budding star Prince Fielder starting at first base, Ricky Weeks at second, Bill Hall at third, Mike Cameron, a respected clubhouse leader, was the center fielder. There was a lot of representation on this club, something very much missing from his previous club in Cleveland. Sabathia didn't feel like an outlier with the Brewers. He felt as though he belonged. And with this newfound motivation, CC pitched better than arguably at any point in his entire career. After tossing a quality start to beat the Rockies in his debut for the Brewers, CC made his presence known emphatically in a dominant run of three July starts, where he tossed three consecutive complete games, including a shutout against the division rival St. Louis Cardinals. With four straight wins and four starts, Sabathia had sent Milwaukee into a frenzy, as Miller Park ticket sales surged for his start specifically. With Sabathia feeling the momentum and the Brewers winning 12 of 21 games after his acquisition, the team only continued to improve in August. Sabathia would start six more games in August, winning all six and going eight innings or more in four of them. He tossed another shutout against the Washington Nationals on the eighth, and two starts later notched another complete game against the Houston Astros. Sabathia closed his month of August with a near no-hitter against the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Southpaw tossed 117 pitches in the shutout, surrendering a lone hit in the bottom of the fifth inning. Sabathia fumbled what appeared to be a rather routine play just in front of the pitcher's mound, and many thought it was an error, but the official scorer ruled it a clean base hit. Some Brewers fans still believe this should be a no-hitter, and I'm kind of with them. Still, despite the controversy, CC now had five complete games and three shutouts in just 11 starts with the Brewers, with the team going 10-1 in his starts through the end of August. Milwaukee had far and away their best month of the year, going 20-7 in the dog days of August, with their 80-56 record being second best in the NL behind the Cubs, good for a five-and-a-half game lead in the wildcard race. But seemingly out of nowhere, the team hit a wall. Not just any wall. This team drove full speed off a cliff into the abyss. The Brewers were suddenly skidding very hard, losing 15 of their 20 games in September, dropping series to the Mets and Cubs, teams they absolutely needed to keep pace with in order to stay in contention. CC came back down to earth a little bit as well, still giving the Brewers seven strong through his first three September starts, but not enough to halt their losing ways. A loss on the 20th in a game that Sabathia started against the Reds put the Brewers at 84 and 71, now two and a half games back of the Mets in the wildcard race, in danger of fumbling their best chance at a playoff berth in over 25 years. The front office grew desperate, and they made that clear by making the shocking move to fire manager Ned Yost with 12 games left on the calendar in hopes of lighting a fire under their team. With their pitching staff depleted, interim manager Dale Sweeham desperately looked for answers and found them in CC Sabathia, who demanded the ball to help his team and keep the season alive. Despite entering a contract year and potentially risking millions of dollars with injury, CC Sabathia would start three of the final eight games of the regular season. He would throw 335 pitches in the last nine days, with each start coming on three days rest. The first start was that loss against the Reds, but CC would be sure to bring his A game in his final final two regular season outings of the year. After the Brewers rattled off back-to-back -back wins to gain a game on the Mets, Sabathia returned to the mound against the Pirates, the same Pirates he nearly no-hit a month prior. Unsurprisingly, he trolled seven innings of one-run ball and struck out 11 batters, the most of any start he had pitched for the Brew Crew. This netted them a much-needed 4-2 victory, their third win in a row, and enabled Milwaukee to tie themselves up with the Mets in the wildcard race. The Brewers would complete a sweep of the Pirates and split the first two games of their final set against the division winner Chicago Cubs. This put them at 89-72 and 72, heading into the final game of the season, needing a victory and a Mets loss against the Marlins to find a way into the postseason. On three days rest, once again, CC demanded the ball for Game 162. Maybe it was the intensity of the moment, maybe it was the electrified crowd, maybe he simply had his stuff that day, but CC Sabathia pitched one of the best games of his career in front of one of the loudest crowds in Milwaukee's history. The Cubs grabbed an early unearned run, and then the Brewers worked three walks around a double to tie the game up at one in the seventh. Along the way, CeCe was dominating the division-winning Cubs, retiring 11 in a row after that second inning. Finally, in the eighth, Ryan Braun delivered a signature moment of his career, a towering two-run shot to left field to give the Brewers a 3-1 to -one lead and send Miller Park into a frenzy. Finally, in the ninth, with CeCe handed his first lead of the entire game, he silenced the Cubs, facing the minimum and 
finishing yet another complete game, his seventh in 17 starts for the Brewers. Fans were overjoyed as the Brewers won their 90th game of the year, but nothing was guaranteed yet. Fans waited afterward to watch the end of the Mets game against the Marlins, and after the Mets officially lost, the long wait was finally over. Brewers fans rejoiced as Milwaukee finally returned to the playoffs after 28 years. Tears of joy were surely shed that day, and although the Brewers' playoff run was brief thanks to a first-round matchup with the eventual champion Philadelphia Phillies, 2008 serves as a year to remember to this day for the Wisconsin faithful. Overall, CC Sabathia had one of the best second halves of any pitcher in MLB history once he was traded to the Brewers. In the end, he led MLB in complete games, shutouts, innings pitched, and games started, finishing fifth in Cy Young voting for the NL despite pitching only half the year in that league. He also garnered enough votes to finish sixth in the NL MVP voting, and it's justifiable, considering that the Brewers' magical run would have fallen apart without their newly acquired ace taking the ball three times in their final eight games. He had a 1.65 ERA and 1.0 whip with the Brewers as well, bringing his complete year in total to a 2.70 ERA and 1.12 whip. To illustrate his presence appropriately, CC Sabathia was worth 4.6 Fangraphs war during his stint with the Brewers alone. Of pitchers who threw at least 100 innings during the 2008 season, only 18 pitchers compiled more than that war value over the entire season. Only 18 pitchers could say that they were more valuable in a full season than CC was for the Brewers in a half season. After their quick playoff exit, the Brewers did make a push to bring CC back on the long term, and he did express great desire to stay with Milwaukee. But the Brewers' budget simply couldn't compete with the rest of the league, and Sabathia ended up departing for the Yankees, rejecting the Brewers' five year $100 million offer. Still, I don't think Brewers fans had any hard feelings for CeCe, and I think CeCe found a certain rejuvenation with Milwaukee that he desperately needed. The Brewers had officially set themselves up with a winning culture that would result in another playoff berth a few years later, and their first playoff series win in 30 years. Sabathia went on to win a ring with the Yankees in his first season in the Bronx, winning ALCS MVP and spending a decade in the Bronx to close his illustrious career. He notched three more All-Star nods and would finish in the top four of Cy Young voting three years in a row to start his massive contract. But CC needed the Brewers, as much as the Brewers needed him. Kinda seems like they fixed each other, and that's what makes this story kind of beautiful. But that's where this brief story also comes to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video, and I'll see you guys next time.